Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in for our webinar today at Escape Studios. Alistair Cross will be presenting his webinar, There is more to VFX than Hollywood, shortly. My name is Flora and I'm the Training and Recruitment Advisor here at Escape Studios. If you have any questions for Alistair, please note that he will be answering your questions at the end of the webinar. Also, if you are always curious about the VFX industry, why not try our VFX Taste today at our Academy in London or try our two weeks VFX online taster course. Please do visit our website escapestudios.com and click onto the courses page where you will find more information about the dates, fees and availability. Any questions about our training? Please do not hesitate to email us at training at escapestudios.com. If anyone has any problems with the audio or the visual for this webinar, please do not worry as we will release the recording of this webinar next week. I hope you will enjoy the webinar and I'll hand over the microphone to Alistair now. Thanks guys and enjoy. Thank you Flora. So hello everybody and welcome to this evening's webinar hosted by Escape Studios. My name is Alistair Cross and I'm going to be talking to you about my experience so far in the visual effects industry and in particular a rather unusual and unique project that I worked on which was one of my first jobs as a freelancer. So hopefully everybody can see what's on my screen. If not, um, just drop a message and hopefully one of the girls will be able to sort that out for you. I'm going to be showing a few slides. We'll be looking at a few clips I've brought along and we're going to have a little poke around inside Maya at one of the scenes that we use to make this shot. <coughs> Excuse me. So I suppose first of all, what is the purpose of this webinar? Um, well, for most of us, when we think of visual effects, we think of Hollywood blockbusters. Anything you've seen, I suppose, in the last 10 years is full of visual effects. Uh, the likes of Iron Man, Life of Pi, the Harry Potters, etc. All the things that we see with cool explosions and dragons and dinosaurs and aliens and all the rest. And I suppose in a lot of ways, that's what entices um, most of us to get into this industry. It's um, it's quite a nice thought to think that you might one day have had a part to play in <clears throat> in making one of these blockbuster films and see your name on the big screen and um, that's why I suppose well that's why I got into it for starters and I'm sure many others as well. Um, there's obviously less obvious visual effects projects um, films as well. Set extensions are an example of something that isn't quite as sort of in your face, I suppose, as explosions and aliens. If you think of any kind of period films, for example, The King's Speech or uh, TV shows such as Boardwalk Empire, it's not, it's not all about the explosions, it's more about blending the real life set into, um, I suppose, what the accurately historical world that it's supposed to be set in. So those are um, the sort of less obvious examples of visual effects. Um, other things that you see it in every day is advertising. It's um, pretty much every ad you see will have been retouched at some point or had visual effects added to it. It's usually CG elements added, rig removal. Um, if anybody's seen the IKEA Garden Gnomes ad, <coughs> excuse me, um, that was all. As far as I'm aware, that was they were all real gnomes, but they had all the wires removed afterwards. Color correction, grading, all that kind of stuff. Um, goes on behind the scenes and we don't really notice it, we just see the, the finished products. So there's plenty of different examples of varying skill sets that are used in this industry and I suppose that's what I'm really here to talk to you about today is just how this project that I worked on is another example of the variation of work in this industry and how it has its own challenges and rewards and I suppose that's what keeps it fun and what keeps it interesting and, and what keeps us coming back for more. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a bit of a bit of a cough today, so bear with me. Right, so let's move on. Next slide. So, um, before I get into this project, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about myself and how I got to this point and why I'm here talking to you today. Uh, my name is Alistair Cross. As I said earlier, I have a website there if you want to check it out. A little bit out of date, but I try and keep posting on it as often as I can. Um, underneath that is Polar Media, which is the company I worked for um, when I was doing this project. And you can have a look at their website as well. I think it's quite out of date, but there's still some good stuff on it. 
Um, so, but I didn't start in this industry. I did a computer science degree, and after that, worked for three or so years for IBM, doing nothing at all related to this kind of work. So, after a stint of travelling, I took a leave of absence. I came back and realised that it was not what I wanted to do, and through friends and a bit of research and some contact with people, I discovered that I could get into visual effects and get into CGI. And it was always something I'd been interested in, but it seemed like such a daunting industry to try and approach. I mean, where, where do you even start? Where do you start learning this stuff? You could be sitting at home for years playing around with Maya or 3D Max or any of those programs and not really get anywhere. So through a friend and research, I found Escape. And they offered me pretty much exactly what I was looking for to start from scratch with no experience and to fast track, I suppose, your way to becoming a professional and, and being able to apply for work in this industry. So um, I did that, came over here, left my job, uh, moved to London, did the three month visual effects production course which brought me up to speed and I was at a position where I could finish my show reel, I could start thinking about looking for work. Um, <clears throat> as it happens, Escape offered me a job afterwards as a studio assistant, so that meant I would be in the classrooms with other students who were doing the courses as well um, and help them out with problems they had and their projects and everything else like that. And I was there for a year or so doing that and I suppose the reason I mention it is that it really solidified my understanding of everything that I had learned on the course myself and gave me gave me the confidence to to approach my real working career I suppose when I left here and I think without that year of um, solidifying my understanding I would have found the job that I had to work on a lot tougher than than I did it was tough enough as it was so let's move on a little bit then. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this project um, that you can see in front of you. So this is just a still from it. Um, so when I left Escape Studios, I got a freelance job at a small boutique place in South London called Polar Media. And these guys have carved out a bit of a niche for themselves doing animations, visualizations for, um, for oil and gas companies. So they had a, quite a lot of experience in dealing with the assets that would be used, um, everything from CAD models that engineers design and export, um, and it can be quite tricky dealing with these really high detail models, so um, this is something they've become quite good at over 10 years or so. Um, and after about two weeks of work in there, we were approached by uh, a marketing company who were working on behalf of a very large British oil company, um, who were one of the dozen or so um, sponsors for the London Olympics last year and what these guys wanted to do was create a visual experience as part of their showcase I suppose and, and part of their promotion for the event. <coughs> Polar Media had, we had done some work for this company before in the past so there was already a relationship with them, we knew some of the marketing guys, they knew we had the ability to deliver high quality work um, <clears throat> so that was a good starting point and I don't think that I would have got the job if it wasn't for that and the reason is that we were working in collaboration with MPC who um, some of you might know are one of the largest and most respected uh, visual effects house in the world today and they were they were um, landed with the brunt of the work I suppose we were to do two shots but it was a real honour to be asked to work alongside this massive company who have such a great track record of producing such amazing work so the pressure was definitely on and um, it was a yeah we definitely sort of hit the ground running we had to anyway <clears throat> so yeah we did two shots um, later we took on a third shot just to balance things out a little bit and the brief was they wanted to create an immersive experience for the viewer and the audience and the idea was to take them on a journey through the current and future plans for the company. I think they had um, they had all these sort of future technology projects that they were trying to showcase um, technology that existed already or concept technology that they wanted to show off to prospective buyers, I suppose, or uh, politicians, um, 
general big wigs around the world, I think, people who are going to be around for the Olympics. So this had to be something quite special. Um, and instead of going for the standard um, sit people in a room and make them watch something on a screen, they decided to go for this immersive experience. And um, they did this, or this was to be achieved, rather, by creating a series of bespoke projection setups, each slightly different than the other, but enabling us to give the viewer a sense that they were, I suppose, part of the performance and that they were surrounded by uh, all this lovely stuff that we we're seeing on the screen. So I'm going to start showing you stuff now instead of just talking. Excuse me. If we have a look at this slide here, this is, I suppose, a viewer's perspective of what the space looks like. So there was four areas in this show. It was to be shown in the Royal Opera House, which is in Covent Garden in London. And they essentially had this, this area custom built to accommodate for um, the people that would be coming through it and, the, and what would be seen, the spaces that they needed to use to project the, the footage. So this was, the, this was known as Area 2. Um, and we can see here there's a, there's a back wall, two side walls, and a floor. And this floor moved up and down depending on what was being shown. Um, these walls would also tilt in from, they'd pivot up from up here, so they were a slight, slightly oblique angle, depending on what was being shown as well. But I'd say, to give you a sense of scale, um, I'd say these are usually about two or three stories high. I remember going to the uh, test screening and we had to climb a fair few stairs just to get to what would be the viewing perspective, which is up high. Um, so they were pretty huge. Um, so to give you, it's, it's quite hard to, to demonstrate, I suppose, how this actually looked, but be, um, the company that did this have built a, um, or they made a, a video after the event, which shows the, I suppose, gives you a sense of the actual experience of walking through the area. So I have that here. I'll have a tiny bit of it here, just to give you a sense of what it was like to walk down the stairs and see the first or the second area that we would see. So hopefully this is playing okay for you guys. I know there's been some problems with videos for, with webinars and streaming, but um, I'm going to stop it here. <clears throat> so this um, hopefully outlines just a little more clearly what it was like. So you'd walk down these stairs, regular corridor, and here is the balcony, and this was the area too that we would look at. So here is the floor. At this point it's raised, and there's the back wall. You can't really see the side walls, but they're there. Um, so that was just, just to show you how this is done. And it's really nice that they put this together because it's quite hard to explain this, to break it down in you know, any other way other than showing the surrounding space that they had built. Um, I'm actually going to show you the shot that I'm talking about now just to give you some kind of perspective on where we are. Cool, here we are. Um, but this is the shot that I'm going to be going through with you today. And there we are. So it's about 20 seconds and a couple of months of work. And for anyone who's still a little bit confused, um, I'm just going to go forward again to this. These are the, the back walls again, side walls, the floor has dropped at this stage, and this is what we see. So I'm going to go into more detail about how it's all done, um, why it looks the way it does, the kind of challenges that we face doing it, and um, hopefully that will make everything a little clearer. So let me just move on here. So the first job I had to do was to become, two weeks into my first visual effects job, I had to be an on-set visual effects supervisor. Um, anybody who's done that kind of work before or knows anything about it will appreciate that. It's quite a daunting task. Um, it's normally, I mean, it's it's quite a coveted role, I suppose, in film, definitely. If I mean, this is not something that was I could relate to being on set, say, at Pinewood Studios for the next James Bond film. It wasn't quite that scale, and I didn't have that sort of responsibility. But the role is the same. Um, <clears throat> the whole point of the visual effects supervisor really is to, is to collect data, really, and um, make informed decisions about the most efficient and effective ways to solve any problems that you run up against. Um, and it takes a good understanding of 
the pipeline before and afterwards to foresee any problems you might have. Obviously, everyone needs to know the brief and needs to know what the final shot is supposed to look like. Um, and I suppose traditionally, visual effects supervisors are creatives but have a good understanding of, of the technological side of things as well. So you know the limitations and they work quite closely with uh, visual effects producers and just are quite an integral part of the team at this stage as well. So this was daunting mainly because, as I said, I was, I was straight in the job. I was working with some very experienced freelance directors, producers, camera crew. So I was really conscious that I didn't want to, I didn't want to screw up. I didn't want to make myself look stupid on the first day, do something wrong, break something, forget to do something. So I was, I did go in quite prepared. And I suppose in this industry, the more, the more you have to take home, the better. You can't really lose by having too much information. So the first big step in um, in any visual effects shot is um, taking set data. Now, if I just quickly go back to oh, wrong one, to here, the first part of the shot is live action. So we're filming these two scientists, and the idea was to put this um, stylized oil rig on the table and that was going to make up the first part of the shot. So we knew all this going in, and that was fine. Um, so my job then was to take as much set data as I could. And I've got a few screenshots up from the, sh from the shoot. Here's the lab. We went to a lab out in West London. That was, it was a working facility, um, which they kindly allowed us to film in. Um, obviously, stuff wasn't on here, but um, they did use this on a daily basis. There's Robin, the director, and here's some of our camera gear, lights. Um, these are some um, things that I brought along to help me capture lighting information. The idea is that you take a photograph, you hope, or ideally through the camera that you're filming through, and use this as a, a sort of a basic lighting setup. So instead of taking your, your CG rig or whatever 3D object you want to place in your scene, um, when you get into Maya or whatever software you're using, you take this image, you create two spheres, color one white, color one gray, mid gray, and try and light those. So that when you have those lit to look like they belong in the scene, you can safely start lighting your CGI knowing that you've got 80 or 90% of the lighting already done. <coughs> Excuse me. One picture I don't have, which I'm annoyed about because it's, it's a, a nice thing to show, is... Um, I took a picture of a chrome ball. Um, the idea of this being to collect information of the lighting around the room. So you take a photo from the same angle again, where the camera is. Um, ideally, you take a couple of different exposure brackets so that you can create a high dynamic range image of, um, of the reflection of the room. And you can use this to cast your secondary lighting into the scene. And it works really, really well. Um, as a starting point. Obviously, you do need to add in your, your main lights, your key lights. Here we can see there's plenty of overhead lighting, so that was something I need to take note of. You can even go as far as to finding out what type of bulb is in these lights and what sort of color temperature they burn at, um, depending on how specific you need to be or how realistic your shot needs to look. Um, what else do we have here? Tracking markers. So this is a flat table. We need the first step in any visual effects shot, as I started saying earlier, is to turn the 2D plate that you film into a 3D scene. So you can't, any film you go and see, Harry Potter, Iron Man, whatever it is, that is usually the first step that happens. You can't place any 3D object into a 2D scene until you make it to represent that 2D scene in 3D space as well. So that's what camera tracking is about. And um, it's vital because if it, if it doesn't work, it looks wrong and all your nice texturing and lighting and rendering will just won't work. So tracking markers are placed to help the tracking software uh, pick out points of contrast that it can lock onto as it's going through the shot and trying to work out the triangulation of the points and and uh, recreate the camera data. So I mean, I was I thought I was being a bit heavy-handed putting some of these down, but um, too too much information isn't or isn't ever really going to be a bad thing for this kind of work. Um, what else have we got here? This is just more. So I have this, um, <clears throat> this was a mini green screen type effect. 
um, the idea was that under this table would be black and we would have some more CG stuff coming out from under the table. So we wanted a nice edge that we could either roto or key out um, with ease, I suppose. And as it happened, it wasn't as easy as it, as it was supposed to be, but I think that's something that you just get used to in this, in this kind of work. So um, let's move on. <clears throat> now, this was um, problem number one, I think, came just after breakfast. And they told me that we were filming on a very wide 6 millimeter lens. Um, for anybody who's done any kind of camera tracking, that's um, it's not ideal, really. Um, the first thing you want to do when you've tracked your shot is to flatten the plate so that you can match your CG in um, Maya or whatever it is with the idea in mind that when you've finished your CG, you render it and then you re-warp your CG to match the, the lens distortion on the, on the camera. But this is massive. It's like, I think there's a 180 degree field of view it was a very, very expensive lens, um, and I wasn't really sure at the time why they decided to use this, because as far as I was aware, we were literally pulling back over this table, and that was it. So being new and naive, I didn't really want to question it. I assumed the direction he was doing, um, and just worried about it later. So one of the nice things about this job is the collaboration that we had, and... Um, we worked with some really, really talented people in MPC who they brought in. One of them was a projection consultant, and she had done uh, lots of work before, um, sort of projection mapping on buildings, all that kind of stuff. So she really knew what she was talking about. And she came up with a really nice way of um, flattening this plate. Now, normally, you would go into some tracking software, 3D Equalizer, PF Track, or even you could even use Nuke to uh, remove the lens distortion from this. For some of the tracking software, it does tend to struggle. If anyone's tried to track any GoPro footage, I think depending on what software you use, sometimes the algorithms they use to calculate the lens distortion just don't go that low. So it doesn't it doesn't work. And I would safely bet that if you tried to uh, unwrap this in 3D Equalizer, I think I used, uh, it just wouldn't it just wouldn't like it. So that was the problem. But um, this girl had come up with a, a very clever solution using some sort of complicated maths that I never really looked at because it was lots of lines and numbers. Um, <clears throat> but her idea was that instead of flattening it in the tracking software, why don't we flatten it in Maya? So I'm going to jump into Maya now and show you how that was done because this I thought was quite cool. Uh, hopefully everybody can see this. It says that you can see it, so that's good. So in here we are in Maya. I have a sphere. And onto this sphere, through the camera that I've tracked, I've projected the footage. Um, I should say, actually, at this point, this is before any tracking happens. So this was the wizardry that uh, this girl had worked out. Let me just go inside here. Whatever way she had done it, um, when you look through the camera, this sphere or this footage is mapped to the inside of this sphere. And because it's curved, it essentially reverses the effect of the lens distortion, if that makes any sense. So there's the sphere with the footage mapped on it. Um, now, if I jump into the camera view, this is looking through um, the camera. Now, I have tracked this shot, and you can see I have my tracking markers here. Um, but essentially what we did was we just took this, this footage, um, took a still camera, just played the footage onto this on the sphere and rendered that out and that gave us this flattened plate so as you can see the lines are nice and straight we have lost a lot of information so if I jump back to where's my thing on see how much we can see we can see right the way around this corner we can see this yellow thing all these pipes the corner of the room but when we flatten it we've lost pretty much all of that but this is where the beauty of the filming on the 6mm lens came in. So the director could come to me and I've tracked the shots and we can sort of flick through. I've got my rig on the table in the right place and essentially what you can redo is reframe this. So I can select my camera and the director can come in behind me and in real time say, oh I want you to turn a little bit to the right and I can just 
swivel about. Probably wouldn't do that, but he might say he wants to look down a bit more as we fly over the rig. And as I click through, everything stays in place. And we can do this almost to your heart's content. Now you can see at the edge it starts to, the illusion starts to break a little bit. And if we go crazy, you'll see that, yeah, that's kind of as far as you can go. But um, this is a really nice idea. And if you think about the alternative to doing something like this, you'd have to get all your crew back, go back into the lab, stop production of whatever they're doing for day and refilm. Whereas here, you can you can literally just do it on the fly. So that was the point of filming on that massive lens and something I'd never would have thought of and clearly takes just experience as a director and someone who understands the, the process to, to come up with. So I was really impressed with that. I thought that was quite cool. Um, okay, let's jump out of Maya and go back here. Excuse me, we'll have some water. So let's move on. So that was it. The shot was tracked. Rig was placed in. Rig was all lit, rendered. Um, now we need to clean it up. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you could see it there. Let me just quickly jump back into Maya. In the background, we have. Mm, come on. Let's go to the beginning. So we have these dials that obviously represent something to do with this machine. And um, because we were in a working lab, we couldn't have any equipment on. But the um, the client was quite specific that this would look wrong to the, the people in the know if we were to show this shot and these dials were at zero. I don't know if you can really see that. They're, they're all at zero. So they needed to be at, I think, 12 and 11, respectively. So that was another issue. And this is another thing I had to come up with on set. Um, how are we going to do this? Are we going to... Are we going to paint them out? Are we going to make them in CG? Are we going to do a matte painting? We had a special effects guy who uh, had all this green tape, so we, we cut out some circles and put, put green circles over these with the idea that we could key them out and replace them with um, just sort of the matte painted ones or, or the, the CG ones. In the end, uh, we didn't use the, the ones with the green. It just it cut off too much of the border and it just made it harder. So we filmed them as they were and I tracked the centers of these dials. So what that enabled us to do was then just to, once we had the shot tracked and everything, create uh, the map painted ones and just literally snap them. Um, they were just little circles of geometry with textures projected on them. <clears throat> and we could just snap them to these points and be fairly confident that they would stay in the right place as we move throughout the shot. Um, so let's go back here. So yeah, this was these were the dials. Obviously, they couldn't be on, so we had to we had to do some fudgery to make that point at twelve and point at eleven and still look realistic. Luckily enough, it was far enough back in the shot and it was so small on screen that we could get away with quite a lot. And I think that's one of the big things about um, visual effects is you, you know do do what you can get away with, and it's amazing how much you can get away with, especially when motion blur is added and all that kind of stuff. It's not something you should rely on, but just keep in mind that. It's not always going to be as clear as it looks to you on your screen. Um, where am I now? So, yeah, that was the main. Uh, so we had to, yeah, we had to do the marker removal from the tables and the floor and the, the back wall, and place this in, and also row to the edge of that table, so we got a nice clean edge, and that we could, uh, that would finish our shot. So I'm going to quickly show you a breakdown of this whole shot. Now, this is a massive file, so it won't play, so I'm going to scrub through it, and hopefully you'll be able to see it at the same speed as I'm looking at it. So, here we have the original plate again. Flattened using that sphere technique. Road on cleanup, and you might be able to see here the change between the dials in the background. So, those are the off ones. Those are on. They do look a bit different, but you get away with it. No one's looking at that because then we see the oil rig, which we fly over here. Shadows on the table from the lighting. The beauty pass. Self-shadows. Occlusion. Very small amount of motion blur always sits in nicely, especially around the edges. 
and then the final grade. Now the final grade was all done at MPC. We we let we sent them like this. Um, so we just matched the plate as best we could. They did want it stylized in a certain way. They wanted a little bit of glow on it, so um, we added a touch of that. Um, but then they made this change here to make it a little punchier, a lot more contrasty, and generally kind of cooler looking. So in any other projects, this would you'd be finished. This would be your visual effects shot. Um, almost while it's not not quite as glamorous as you know cars exploding over bridges or whatever, um, it's still it's encompass all the steps. So you've taken your footage, you've tracked it, you've put your CG in, you've done your cleanup, and you've rendered it, and you've comped it and graded it, and there you are. But <clears throat> for us, this was only really a third of the work because we still had to do the um, we still had to do the rest of the shot. So the the next stage was to add. Let me just quickly jump back here again. This is the original video. So add this part. So these are what are called drilling wells and the idea is these are laid down from the bottom of the oil rig and this is supposed to represent a reservoir an oil reservoir this kind of grid pattern it looks a bit dodgy here I don't know how this is put together I've got a slightly better one actually um, line up. so this is a, a test one I used, I used quite a lot but gives you a better sense of the the space so we you can see kind of a lot clearly, a lot more clearly the, the back wall, the floor, side walls, etc. And it does line up, I promise. I just, I don't know how they did it um, after the event, but it didn't look quite as good. So this was the next challenge. We had to, we had to try and match the, the movement of this uh, oil rig to try and match the, try and have the wells coming out. And there's, there's not much movement there at all, but it was a real struggle to get that working and, and we tried lots of different things, snapping locators and uh, like aligning them to animation paths and all the rest. But I think in the end, I just I just hand keyed it because it was proven to be too much of a of a hassle. And you do get away with it. You can't really tell whether there's any slip. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest things that they wanted us to do was to give this sense of uh, immersion, and they accomplished this by having. Lots of shadows on the walls. We have a shadow from the table. We have the shadows from the wells. Now, it doesn't look like they're all that far out, but it does give you a sense that it's not just flatly projected against the wall. And I think this is how they really won with this project, is even though you know how it's done, you know what's going on, you still, it still feels 3D and still feels like you could go around the back of it if you want to. And um, in this kind of an environment, I think that's quite crucial to get looking right. Um, Another of the biggest challenges we faced was the sheer size of these images. So this back wall, this, um, I suppose, lone visual effects shot itself was 2520. This is pixels now, 2520 by 1050. So that's already, well, bigger than HD uh, across and slightly less uh, up. But, I mean, that, that's big. Um, so that's one thing you have to render. The whole back wall was a resolution of 3360 by 2640, um, which is pretty big as well. Then we had three more walls to do. Each side wall was 2060 by 2640, and the floor was 2400 by 1584. So we were a very small studio. I think we had four render nodes at the time, and we were doing... But well, there was this shot, and my colleague and friend did another shot, but he had five cameras and a lot more to render than me. I mean, most of mine is black, so I was quite lucky, really. Um, <clears throat> but this was a big challenge. I mean, we just didn't have the resources to, to render stuff. And one of the main things that we came across was that, you know, it would be Friday evening, we'd been busting a nut all week to get this done, late nights, all the rest, and then we get a call and the resolution should have changed. So all our renders are wrong. We need to do them again. Um, and I think that's just what you get used to. Um, a lot of this work is just fixing problems. But as frustrating as that can be, it's, it's really rewarding to see it all come together. Um, <clears throat> so the last main challenge that I'm going to go through was this last bit. Now, the, the shot was supposed to end here. We were supposed to come up, and that was it. But they asked at the end if we could have a flyover of the rig um, in colour. So that's what this bit is. 
And you can kind of see there how this works. Now, we, we rendering from all these cameras and then it project them back onto the walls. So we have the back wall, side walls, bottom wall, and it just all lines up really nicely. And here it doesn't look very convincing, but when you add that shadow that we had in the... Let's just go back here for the comparison. When you have the shadow, it looks the real deal, I think. So these all almost line up there. Um, but this, again, was another problem we had because we want it to be quite seamless changing from rig, from each rig. But here, if you remember, we had the, the warped footage, re-flattened, rendered, re-projected. So it was kind of anybody's guess what perspective this was and what the camera settings were supposed to be. So we couldn't literally have a, a takeover from one rig to the other, which is why we have this kind of fuzzy TV staticky stuff to give the illusion that it's the same thing when really the perspective is quite different. But at, at the time, you're not even looking at that. So that's another way of um, just getting away with something, really. Um, that's just what you have to do. So that is kind of it, really. Um, I, I'm going to show you um, this, this clip that I did is, while well, it was fun and challenging, not the most visually like amazing thing to look at. So I have very kindly been given permission by MPC and the marketing company that did this to show you a bit of a montage of, um, I'm going to play it on my machine, it might not work for you, but all I'm really doing is just giving you an idea of um, some of the other amazing work that MPC did and uh, my colleague as well, and just a slight taster of the feel of the whole experience itself. So this is all supposed to be representing information. A lot of this was done in, I think practically all of it was done in Cinema 4D and After Effects. Any uh, motion graphics artists might recognize some fairly popular plugins um, that are being used all over the place at the moment with a nice effect here, must be said. And again, they have the shadows projected on the back wall. Such a simple technique, but it's just so effective. This was another nice shot of some floating oil blobs that give the impression that they kind of burst out of this Petri dish or bubble and float around in front of you. Really nicely done. And some nice infographics on the side as well. <coughs> so this, I'm just going to pause this quickly actually. This was a different area um, and what they've done in this video is they've they placed in this sort of CG environment, these seats. So you would actually go and you'd sit down and you can kind of see here there's there was a ceiling in this area, so you had four walls, um, back wall, and a floor, and um, it made it even more immersive. So this is supposed to represent some nanobots or something that flow through oil um, reservoirs. I'm just going to pause this quickly again. This was another area. Um, they had a balcony here, a viewing platform, and this kind of grid of pillars that would move up and down, and they would project things on to the tops and the sides. In addition, they had these panels that would swing out from left to right, as well as the back wall, this really nice render of uh, an engine. I think it was done by one of the guys who worked on Terminator, or not Terminator, uh, Transformers. Um, just really, really nicely done, I thought, so I thought I'd include that. I don't know if you can see here, but there's something that creeps out from the side. This thing here. This is um, sort of a scale model of a, of a car. And a bit that I haven't included, because it's just too long, is they projected a road, moving footage of a road and a car onto the body of that car, and they would have it driving along the wall. It was just a really nice idea, and it worked quite well. They'd have the car turning left and right, depending on the road direction, and just, again, just showing how the innovation of this idea was um, really, really astounding. So this is a, another shot that we did at Polar Media. This is the one my friend worked on. So he had much more to render, as you can see, five screens, um, much longer shot. But we were really, really proud of it in the end. It worked out so well. I think that they used it as the end of the area, sort of the finale shot, I like to think, anyway. 
and it was just nice because, like I said, we were working in cooperation with NPC and really daunting to be working alongside those guys who have so much experience and talent and we really didn't want to sort of fall behind and make it look bad. So to be included at the end of one of the the areas was, was I think we were quite honoured and uh, everybody seemed quite happy with, with the work that we came out with. So it was all in all a pretty good experience. So that is kind of it, I think. Um, I'm going to put it out to you guys for questions. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, and I will answer them as best I can, I suppose. So a question here from Johan. Uh, how do you get the grey and white ball for when supervising? Um, I, do you mean what? Why do I get them? I'll, I'll, I suppose I'll just go on about them a bit. Um, you can buy them if that's what you're asking in in any garden shop. I suppose they're just plastic balls and they were just spray painted white and grey. Um, the idea behind them is if you take a photo of them, you can bring that photo into Maya or whatever software package that you're using, and just create two spheres and color them white and gray and try and use the picture that you've taken as a reference to light the two spheres in your scene. So using all the other techniques of for lighting um, the high dynamic range image that I mentioned and um, the set data, so knowing what lights are where, um, you can try and match, match the two images, I suppose, you, you, your renders you want to look as close to the, the balls that you've taken a photo of as possible. Um, so hopefully that's, I think that's what you were asking. If not, please correct me. Okay, they're coming in thick and fast now. Um, okay, uh, Theo is the first question. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the state of the VFX industry recently. What is your take on it and has it affected you? Um, yeah, there is. Um, my take on it, I suppose it's, I mean, a lot of industries have sort of good times and bad times, and this just happens to be one of the less good times, really. Um, it has affected me. It's definitely harder to find work, um, and there seems to be a lot of people out there who are very talented and very capable, and in because of that influx of people and that saturation of talent, there's... Um, it's harder to find work and, and the companies who are hiring can kind of pick and choose who they want. But I think if anything it makes you a bit more dynamic and um, makes you look to avenues that you wouldn't necessarily have considered. Um, so I, for example, I did a VFX course and I was always into the live action scene. Now I'm working in a, an animation company that do predominantly, or they do only full CG animations. So um, I think you just can't ever restrict what you what you do, you can't narrow, can't be, can't have a narrow field of view in terms of your abilities, and it's it's always good to keep up to date with the newest technologies, the newest techniques, and um, just keep an open mind about about what you want to do and what you can do. <clears throat> so hopefully that's answered that for you, Theo. Um, Wayne has asked. You said that you were limited by the facilities for the rendering. So did you continue to render out with the equipment you had, or did you use an alternative method? Uh, good question. Um, we did consider some cloud solutions, but at the time, we the biggest problem for that was the sort of bottleneck of bandwidth, I suppose. And because these scenes, um, they were so big, the the oil rigs in the scenes were, I think we were going up to sort of two gigs at the peak of our scene size. They're so detailed, and admittedly, they didn't need to be for a lot of this, but um, when you start stripping them away, you, you do lose a, a sort of a feel of the complexity of the structure, so we didn't want to take away too much. So cloud-based rendering was kind of out the window for us just because the upload times would have been too much, and then if you get something wrong, then you have to upload it again. Um, we didn't look into it a huge amount. I'm sure there's more efficient ways of doing it than that, but we did get another couple of render nodes in towards the end, um, which just about kept us going. Um, but more than anything, we just wanted we just made sure we were as efficient as possible with our renders, um, testing everything like religiously before we sent anything to the farm and making sure that everything that came out was exactly what we expected it to be. So it was a good exercise in terms of being efficient and effective and making sure you know what's what's going on, what every layer is going to be and what every comp is going to look like. Another good technique that we, I think most people will do in this kind of work is before you render out a thousand frames of anything, 
take a, a frame of every layer and try and composite that. If it looks the way it's supposed to, then you can set it off. But there's no point sort of rendering blind and hoping that it's all going to fit together in your compositing package because you might have got something wrong and then you've wasted a, a whole day f of rendering and um, then deadlines are on you and the stress builds up and yeah, that's something you want to avoid. So hopefully that's answered that for you, Wayne. Uh, another question here from Johan. How did it feel handling directors, producers on such an early job? How do you prepare for the social encounters? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of this industry is just about putting yourself out there and being willing to take a step into the, the unknown, I suppose, and just talk to people. And it can be daunting because you don't, they're strangers, but, you know, everybody was there at, the, at some point as well. So more often than not, they will remember what it was like to be there on the first day. And I think they, you know, even if they know nothing about your capabilities, if you're, you know, a decent person and you, um, you're easy to talk to and easy to get along with, and then that's going to make their life easier too. So they'll appreciate that. So just, I suppose, being completely open and, and friendly is, is kind of the best approach. And everybody was quite friendly. There's anybody who isn't, I mean, it's, it's not you, it's probably them. So, that's what I like to try and keep in my head anyway when you do run across the inevitable um, quiet ones or the people who just are a bit gruff. But um, I suppose it's just like any situation. You just have to jump in head first and see what happens. It usually, usually works out okay. Um, I have one here from Geraint. You mentioned that you used CAD files as a start, or at least you have done in the past. How did you find this conversion process? Do you use a plugin such as Polytrans? Uh, good question, Garage. Yeah, we we do. We had um, what did we used to do? So they'd come in as um, I can't remember the file extension now, but we would open them in Navisworks, which is another Autodesk product. Um, and yeah, we use Polytrans well, so we'd export from Navisworks if it was something that we couldn't even bring into Maya. Um, and then I think we had a Polytrans plugin that would strip out a lot of the extraneous geometry or make it slightly more bearable for Maya to handle but we didn't have a like a foolproof streamlined pipeline for it just mainly because it was such a small studio that the guys who would have to sit down and write it were too busy working on their main job and getting projects done for clients that it was just something we never got around to doing. I think now they, they have a few guys who are doing some pipeline bits here and there so they're definitely streamlining some of the um, the processes they use to strip down these massive models and invariably they always come in a bit backwards and twisted and missing faces here and there but it's it's nothing you can't fix it's just slightly tedious work at the best of times okay guys i'm being hassled here um so we have time for one more question if anybody has anything else they'd like to ask okay last question from jesse lowe how long did it take you to finish demo reel what is a reasonable time frame from start to finish um are you referring to my own demo reel or demo reel for the client or for this project? Um, I'm going to assume you mean my demo reel, my own demo reel. Okay. Um, well, I was in a slightly unusual situation because I, ideally what you do is when you finish a course or when you are at the stage where you need to put more shots on, um, you should give yourself a time frame of a couple of months. I had the good fortune to be surrounded by people who were helping me every day, and this is when I was working at Escape, so I kind of chipped away at my reel over the course of a year. Um, it's a double-edged sword in a way, because you can never sit down and just focus on it, and it's always hanging over you, but on the plus side, you can kind of take your time about it and make sure everything looks really, really nice without the immediate pressure of trying to find work. So, to answer your question, um, a reasonable time frame, I mean, you have to be realistic. You don't want to put 10, 15 minutes worth of stuff on. Your reel should be a minute and a half, two minutes at the most, especially if you're a junior. Um, and don't put anything on it that's that you're not completely happy with. So only your best work. So pick two or three shots. Show them one shot after another. Then show your breakdowns. That's it. No faffing around. Don't bother with like credits or music. No one's going to listen to it. You have to remember that the people who are looking at them are looking at hundreds of these things a day and they just want to be, just make it stand out, make it something a bit different. And um, that, I suppose, refers to um, the question that someone had earlier about trying to find work. It's it's really what jumps out of people. Um, there's millions of reels floating around. Everybody's an amazing artist. So try and come up with something a bit different that grabs people's attention. 
even in your cover letter, um, try and be a bit different. I think that's how I got the job I'm in now, is just a little bit, um, I think I showed a bit more personality in my cover letter and that got me an interview and now, I, now I'm working there. So um, your reel will get you in the door, but it's what you're like, I think, that will get you the job. So hopefully that's cleared things up a bit for you. Um, I think I have to stop now, guys, but uh, thank you very much for joining me. And um, this is being recorded, as I said earlier, and it's going to be available sometime in the future. <laughs> I'm not sure when, but um, all the videos and stuff will play nicely if you couldn't see them properly. Um, it'll all be edited down, so all my sniffing and coughing will probably be gone as well. And, um, yeah, thanks for joining.